On today's show, Laura Haywood interviews Tony Grammy and Olivier Award winning lyricist, librettist, poet, novelist, and so much more. The man behind the show that changed my life forever. Oh. Live in studio, my friend, Steven Sater. Wow, to call this man my friend is totally mind-blowing, and he laughs because I tell him this all the time, but even after a couple of years of knowing each other personally, I still can't fully wrap my head around the fact that I'm on the radar of Steven Sater, the man who wrote the libretto and lyrics for Spring Awakening. Back in 2006, an acquaintance invited me to a preview performance of what he called, quote, a revival of a German play from the 1800s. That did not sound like my scene at all, but it was free and right around the corner from my apartment, so I shrugged and accepted the invitation. Well, I don't think I blinked during the entire first act. At intermission, I did manage to utter the words, I think this is amazing. It wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. It was young and angsty and fresh and weird, but it still had this depth. While the emotionally raw parts of me were shuddering, the theater scholar in me recognized roots of the most classical and ancient theater traditions. A boring revival this was not. Instead, here was a brand new kind of musical, a work of art that would inspire me inspire in me a passion for Broadway so great I needed to create an online alter ego to express my love with nearly infinite zeal, and that zeal has turned into my profession. That was almost 15 years ago, and Spring Awakening is hardly the only thing Steven Sater has ever done. In fact, he's here today to talk about Alice by Heart, the novel, a gorgeous poetic expansion of the world behind the musical of the same name, which played last year off-Broadway. It is not a retelling of Alice in Wonderland. Instead, the story's about a different Alice down a different kind of hole, a lost, pubescent girl in the panic of 1940s London seeking refuge in an abandoned tube station for herself and her sick best friend. The other children there do seem to oddly resemble the characters from her favorite Lewis Carroll novel, and the more terrifying the war becomes above ground, the more solace she takes in retelling the story she knows by heart to Alfred, the best friend who is succumbing slowly to tuberculosis. As a boy, Stephen Sater himself was very sick, confined in quarantine most of his young life, and books were his refuge too. So as we read the intertwined stories of these two Alices and the plight of struggling youth, we are in a way learning Stephen's story too. It is the greatest of honors to say these words. Stephen Sater, welcome to Laura Haywood Interviews. Oh, thank you so much. I, I am so touched hearing this. And to think that I, that not I, but that Spring Awakening is in part responsible for Laura, Laura Haywood becoming Broadway girl NYC. I mean, it's kind of amazing it's, to hear. It's, I mean, I can't say it's singularly responsible, but it, uh -huh. if Spring Awakening had not existed in that moment, maybe even in that theater, because that was the theater <laughs> that was around the corner from my apartment, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I would have accepted the invitation to go. And certainly Broadway Girl would not exist if not for Spring Awakening. Um, there were other factors along the way, too. Like if my grandmother had not done regional like <laughs> community theater uh -huh. productions of, mm -hmm. you know, like South Pacific, I might not have, you know, and I, you know, my majoring in theater certainly helped because I was able to, for example, when I saw Spring Awakening to recognize like, oh, there, that's those, those punk kids with microphones in the middle of a classical drama are a Greek chorus, you know, yeah. and because I had studied theater in college, I had that background to recognize the multi layers of the show. But, yeah. but I can say with absolute certainty that you and I would not, well, I would not be sitting here mm. doing this show, and mm. I might not even still live in New York, and I certainly wouldn't be making my life full-time as a Broadway theater lover if Spring Awakening hadn't happened to me. And it does feel like something that happened to me. <laughs> I see. Well, we wrote it for you, largely. Oh my we God. were anticipating you. We had heard about this girl whose grandmother was in South Pacific, and we, <laughs> she's coming to New York. She and, lives, could, could we, oh wait, if we were at the Atlantic, we would be right around the corner from her apartment. Well, this is I, a lot I of lived in Hell's Kitchen. I lived in. This was. I didn't get to see it at the Atlantic, unfortunately, which breaks oh, you my didn't. heart. No, because oh, now. I see. No, I Because now you kitchen. live by the Atlantic. Now I live around the corner from ah, the Atlantic. I see. So you were at the Eugene O'Neill. I saw it at the Eugene O'Neill, mm -hmm. and actually, my um, I. You know, lots of people, lots of Broadway fans collect stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, I collect everything. And I, you know, I still, I have my, all my playbills from every time I saw it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have, t today I'm wearing my Spring Awakening original production logo t shirt and I have the Revival logo t shirt mm -hmm. and blah, blah. Um, but my favorite thing to collect is signage from theaters that I put up in my apartment as art pieces. Um, not so much from shows, but from the theaters themselves. So, like on the back of my front door, it says tickets required for re entry. And um, I have a 
another sign up that says there will be no late seating for this performance. And they're all framed and like beautifully done. But like the prize of my collection is um, this gilded gold sign that says liquor bar and refreshments that was above the bar in the Eugene O'Neill during the original run of Spring Awakening. And um, I don't think I was like drinking a lot of like I don't think I was going to the refreshments at all but I'm like that sh- that sign saw more of Spring Awakening than even I did <laughs> and I saw it so many times so yeah so I just like I carry the energy of that show and what it meant to me everywhere I go but then what's so crazy about it is that I think back you know when we were like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't Spring Awakening and then I think about the fact that you know I referenced in my intro the fact that you were sick as a child yeah and your your illness is what led you to love to loving and understanding literature and so i'm like oh my gosh like the joy of my life was Mm. born directly out of the suffering of your youth oh my gosh and you know i think that there's this sort of cheesy spirituality uh that where people are like everything happens for a reason Mm -hmm. and i'm not trying to say that steven Sater Mm -hmm. got sick so that laura (laughs) haywood could live a life of spreading joy to the world but the fact is that if you hadn't been sick, I don't know mm. where any of us would be and uh, the number of lives that you've changed. Oh, man. It's hard I don't, for me to take that in. I know. And I and I don't ever want you to think that I'm like, good thing you got <laughs> sick. <laughs> mm. but, but I do think about how we never know what sort of the universe has in mind. And, yeah. And, and – or – I don't know. I get I get caught up in the in the logic and the the wording of my own spirituality, mm-hmm. but this has to do with my what I call quote unquote spirituality for atheists, uh-huh. which is that my life is better when I allow myself to pretend I believe in magic. Aww. And as a theater goer, I have more practice at suspending my disbelief than anybody else. Aww. So in the same way that I can go in and become emotionally invested in, uh, you know, Melchior and Venla and still mm-hmm. know that it's really Jonathan Groff and Leah <laughs> Michelle, I can both believe that everything happens for a reason and that the universe has a plan and also mm-hmm. be like, it's just like all random. <laughs> it's and, all random and crazy know, and, and everyone's bo- they can playing both, a role. Yeah. They can both coexist. So anyway. Yeah. So, but well, so what I'm mm. saying to wrap this all up <laughs> is that Spring Awakening launched my religion, <laughs> and uh, and Alice by Heart is certainly um, a new like um, religious event. You know, it's so mm-hmm. important to me too. Um, you know what I remember uh, was uh, when we had our broad when our Broadway marquee first went up, and I had seen some. I was on my own. I was walking out of some. I was walking out of a meeting, I think, and I, it was. But it was like six. 30 in the evening, so the lights were dimming. It was fall. And I, walk, I happened to walk by the street. I wasn't even anticipating. I t- walked past 49th Street. And was, I saw the marquee, and I thought, oh, my God, Spring Awakening, that's the name of a book in my room. That's what I – because it's what it was. You know, first of the, all – The Frank Vatican. Yeah, it's 100% what it was. Yeah. And it um, – I mean, I first discovered it at a library in Evansville – um, Indiana, which is where I grew up when I was in high school. And you were a little, like a little local theater star, weren't you? I was. I didn't know you knew that. Yeah, I was. Dude, um, I know <laughs> so much about you. I know so much about you that if I didn't have the excuse of <laughs> calling it research, you would be scared about how uh, much I know about you. <laughs> yeah, I was this, well, as you said, I was this sick kid, and so I was home all the time, and my my mother was taking a Shakespeare, my mother went back to college, she was taking a Shakespeare course, and she would read Shakespeare to me. So like the first theater I encountered actually was Shakespeare and it was my mom reading it and then we like watching Macbeth on TV. And um, and then um, when I started going to school, I hardly went to school, but like seventh, eighth grade, then I was like in school in high school. Um, and was that because my, they figured out that you were allergic to your medicines and stopped giving you those medicines? Like, were you suddenly That was well? part of it. That was part of it. I know I was better, yeah. And I had plastic over everything, yeah, you know, you and I was like, hardly out of the house. And my I don't old, like the term bubble boy, but I feel like that mm-hmm. gives a vid- visual to people about the extent of this quarantine. Well, it was, it was uh, yeah, I was in hospitals a lot, like under oxygen tents. And then I was home with plastic and I couldn't go out. But I would, I, would, I wrote plays. I wrote plays like at sun, for my Sunday school and at home, and we would put in these plays, and like kids, neighborhood kids would come. Do you still um, have these plays? Um, my mother does. 
I think we need to do like a night at 54 Below or something. With the place. Oh, that's so funny. I used to write songs. I had songs in my head, and my mother played piano, and I would sit down, and I would like sing the song to her, and she would write it down. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then when I met Duncan in 1999, I had this play called Umbridge, and at the end of the night, and he sa- had said to me, I was working on, I'm just jumping into a, a crazy other story, but anyway. We just at, need to say, like, mm-hmm. I don't know who's been living under a rock, but Duncan is Duncan Sheet, who Duncan. is your collaborator. Yeah, yeah. So we we met, and I was working on this play, Umbridge, down at here, and um, at the same time, I was doing a radical version of The Tempest with Laurie Anderson in London, and Duncan thought that was very cool, and he said, is there a song in the play you're doing downtown? And I said, oh, there's just this little thing in it that I, I just wrote it myself. And it was, when I wrote it, I remember going back to that five or six year old self who would walk in the backyard and was so sick and I could hear these songs in my head. And so he said, could you fax me the lyric? Duncan said, can you, it was a fax era. And, There's um, nothing that can mm, really like set you in time like that. Like, like fax, that or, yeah, exactly. Um, or the Walkman. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the Sony Walkman. Oh, Sony Walkman, oh, yeah. I will never forget when I got my, I remember when I got my first transistor radio. <laughs> that's, I, old, that's old. Well, so, so, so I gave Duncan this, um, so I went home and faxed him this lyric, and the next day he called me and said, um, I, oh, I bet he was on a landline that he called me. Of course, but anyway, of yeah. So, so um, he said, I have a song for you, and I said, I'm leaving for London. He said, oh, meet me for lunch. And I did, and he handed me a CD, and he had set verbatim the words of the song, and it was so beautiful. And um, I left for London, and I came back, and I was, it was Rob Sedgwick who was playing this role in my play. And he said, there's this amazing Dylan song we have to use for the play. And I said, oh, I have a song we wrote with Duncan Sheik. And he said, no, we need an up-tempo song. And I said, maybe I could write an up-tempo lyric. Mm-hmm. And I went home and wrote this lyric called Mr. Chess, which was... It's kind of the first lyric I wrote as a lyric. And I faxed it to Duncan, who was in Sundance. Mm -hmm. And then he said it verbatim. And I went to some. We used these two songs in the play. And in the meantime. Are those recorded anywhere? Yeah, they're on our album. This album, Phantom Moon. Okay, well, I got to find it. Yeah. Um, Actually, the first one on the C is not on that album. But um, it have to become a bonus track or something. You know what I imagine? I imagine, uh, is it Rob Sedgwick? Uh-huh. I rem- I imagine him being like, dude, I asked for Bob Dylan and you're giving me the <laughs> barely breathing guy. Like, what the fuck? I mean, I, look, I, I, Duncan and I know each other pretty well. And, um, <laughs> and now I, you know, I get a kick out of barely breathing and mm. it certainly put him on the map. And, and, you know, but I can imagine that, you know, it was like, it was sort of almost like a, a one hit wonder kind of situation for his, you know, for his pop music fame. And I, I can imagine so. somebody who loves Bob Dylan feeling like that was not going to make it. And then here we are. <laughs> now Duncan's like the most celebrated musical theater songwriter of, I know. you know. I know, amazing. But with, that was how it started. And then I got this bug and started sending him lyrics. I started writing lyrics. And I wrote another, like, four. And I was down in his apartment. He was playing through these songs for me. And um, he said, we should do an album together. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so that became this album, Phantom Moon. But then this was this was like two months after I met him, maybe like March of '99. And well, he when was, you sit chanting with somebody for hours, you bond. Oh, well, that's what we did. I know. That's how we met, chanting together. And um, in any event, he came to see this play, Umbridge, and he said he was really moved by it, and said, "Do you know this story? I've probably told it a bunch, but anyway." Yeah, but people listening said, don't know. Yeah, yeah. He said. Um, he was, and I said, we should do a piece of theater together. And he made this face and said, musical theater? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I said, we could do something cool. And he said, I, if I did, he, he says these words are mine. But the point was, this was what he said in brunt, even if I've reworded it. He said, I, if I were going to work in musical theater, I would want to do something where the music is relevant to the culture at large. But the moment he said it, whatever exactly he said, I thought of Spring Awakening. You were like, you know what's relevant to the culture at large? <laughs> this German play from the 1800s. I know, but, but that's how I see literature. I see it as living, as today, as now. I mean, maybe you, you know, that play so full of young people's cries. And it just seemed like the place that kids have found expression of and released from those cries was rock music, was pop music. So it seemed like a great fit. 
Well, obviously I, you were on to something. <laughs> yeah, that worked out. But, but <laughs> <laughs> eight years later, um, it's it's so much work. And oh, I shouldn't say this on the air, but I'm back in the German of Vatican right now, to tell you really? the truth. I am, yeah. Because I've heard you reference before that you have, like, played with the idea of going back. Because didn't Vatican have one other, like... Oh, other plays yeah. of his? He did. He did. And that's another project. But, in fact, I'm... Say it's it. Just, uh, no, I mean, it's I can't. It's just you and I, me I just... Um, there, you know, there may be a further life for Spring Awakening. Let's just say that. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> my gosh. All right, listen. If whatever it is, if it's something that involves m- and more than just you and Duncan, I would like to be an intern on whatever the project is. Like, oh. yeah. Well, I um, wait. Say that again. There is. I just there said there may, may be, be a further life for Spring Awakening. There That's may. all I'm going to say. I will um, be. <coughs> I'm a quote. I'm quote. I'm putting that quote everywhere. Um, well, well, we shall see. But um, but yeah. So I'm back in. So on my altar, my Buddhist altar, which I still chant twice mm-hmm. a day. So does Duncan. Um, I have like the German version of Spring Awakening that I went out and bought shortly after I said that to Duncan. Do you want to know something? We were on cell phones. I swear, because I remember it vividly. I was walking up West Seventy Second Street, and Duncan had said to me when we met at another point um, after this at here, or he said it on the phone. He said, "You know what I hate in musicals? It's when people are talking and then they're singing and they're talking. You don't know why they're talking, what they talk and what they sing, what they sing." <laughs> which again is probably my wording of what he said. But I had this idea on Seventy Second, and I called him and said, "You know, um, maybe the songs could work as internal monologues." that we would go inside the characters and hear, you know, what they have to say. Because I'm a big fan of 20th century literature, you know, so yes, I, I, Joyce is, <laughs> you, you, you pick that up too. So you know, the internal, you know, James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, this was a big thing for me. Um, this was like what you used to read the way that I used to read the Babysitter's Club books. You know, like as a little kid, you were like, Oh my gosh, I can't, not that you were waiting for the new James Joyce to come out, <laughs> but like the way that you would reach for, I don't know, that to me, I think of that stuff as so academic, but maybe you were don't so see it stark that way. for academic, like you didn't have the academic yeah, framework Yeah, I don't for see it. it as academic. To me, it's the, that you're sharing in the greatest conversations with the greatest possible minds that have been around. So you, you're like, why would you, and you don't want to reject the thoughts of your own mind in response to those. It's like playing tennis with somebody who's mm. really great. And so, um, you know, the, Again, in my book, in my plastic line world, books books were like my transport. Books were my way out. Books were my way of seeing. They were my way of feeling the world. I'll tell you what's funny. When we sat down, I, I do have this book, Alice by Heart, which I'm very excited yes, about. Yes, and that's what you're and here to promote, so I don't so want to lose we can sight mention of that. It. We can mention it. That, um, but they, they, you know, it's, it's a YA, young adult imprint. But, of course, the book is so you know, literary and, sort of, you know, ambitious and poetic. And when they talked to me about, you know, I've never read a YA book, and I tried. I started reading a couple, and it's just it's just not for me. Uh-huh. So I reread Tolstoy. I reread, you know, <laughs> Dickens. I reread, like, that was, I thought, I'm going to read great storytellers that appeal to all ages. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think that we can share with people that the day the book came out, you and I actually went to have tea together. We did. We had it was our amazing. own little Alice's tea party, and it was like not only not only did we drink tea, but you <laughs> wore a top hat, and we went to an Alice. <laughs> we went to um, Alice's teacup, which is an That's Alice. So and true. like I was sitting there, like thank goodness we got pictures because I feel like it's mm-hmm. the kind of thing that I would say like. I just went and had tea with you know <laughs> Stephen Sater, and people would be like, "Sure, you did." Uh-huh. Um, but uh, but one of the things we talked about was that. You know from experience that young adults are have just incredibly expansive minds. And if you were reading Shakespeare and Tolstoy and mm-hmm. like Brecht and stuff when mm-hmm. you were 14, then certainly today's youth can they shouldn't be talked down to down to, you know, I probably had a better vocabulary when I was studying for the SATs <laughs> than I do now. And yeah. so and you know what what one thing this book is not is easy. It's, yeah, is I felt like you know sometimes when I'm preparing for an interview, I don't like to do an interview unless I've really immersed myself in the material, and that means reading a book cover to cover. And often I can 
power through it. Or yep. I'll listen to an audiobook on double speed or, you know, uh-huh. and I'll just get just get it into my brain. Yeah. But this one, it's so it reads almost lyrically. Uh-huh. And um and so I found myself reading the sentences slowly and meditatively and uh-huh. allowing the images that they evoked to really be created in my brain. Sometimes I read two or three paragraphs and then put it down and just like let that little scene live in my brain. But I see, I want you to be able to do that. I know. I am. And that's, I meant that as a compliment. Well, thank you. Like yeah, I was saying, yeah. I and mean, people but, associate YA with. I know a book you can get through in, or, in one or night or two nights. Or, or, that, or like, I think it's the way that YA is often regarded is demeaning to young adults. These are not yes. children's books. They are for young adults. It's almost like calling Spring Awakening a young adult piece of theater. Did teenagers were teenagers drawn to it and felt seen by it? Absolutely. But that was not a kids' show. And that's how I feel about Alice by Heart. Will teenagers and young adults be drawn to it and feel seen by it and be moved by it? Yeah, but it's not kid lit. Yeah, I understand. I agree. I think it, it's it's a young adult novel the way Spring Awakening is a young adult musical. Right. I 100% agree. I mean, I, I told you this story that we were at, what was it, Virgin Megastore, that record store yep. where we had mm-hmm. the, the um, album Launch. The signing. Yeah, signing. I was there with my playbills in hand, getting my getting my signatures. I mean, I remember it so vividly. I and then th- these young women showing up with the lyrics written up their legs and up their pants. And I thought, no, we we shortchanging young people all the time. And we talk about a post literate world. Those lyrics are poetic. Those the kids get it. Mm-hmm. They care about it. So why not have a book? You know, um, this is something on which I disagree with Steve Sondheim, and we've had this conversation. He feels, as he said publicly a lot, but we said it re- not recently. It was about a year ago in a conversation that was orchestrated by the dramatist Guild. But he he really feels that audiences have to understand lyrics completely, one hundred percent, the first time through. Mm. I don't feel that at all. Mm -hmm. The works of art I love, and let's just take obvious things, the Mona Lisa. There are things you can revisit again and again that reveal their secrets over time. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're enigmatic on purpose. It's not that they're hiding something. It's that the truth is complicated. The truth of ourselves is multi-layered. We're all so multidimensional, and there's contradiction. That's what's, you know, that's the great thing about, for example, George Bernard Shaw. The villains have all the great lines. They have the great things to say because... As a writer, you can entertain all these points of view. So, But we ourselves do that. We can always see the antithesis to our own argument. So why wouldn't there be qualifications in our thoughts? The book is set in the heart and mind of this young woman. And she sees herself, and she sees the world, and she's delusional. She thinks that reading this book out loud, she can save the life of this boy. What she doesn't realize is that by taking him on this journey through Wonderland, she's ultimately going to save herself. But she lives in a world of books and thoughts, and she has only her own mind to sustain her. So I wanted to give her a great mind and give her a great reference. The book is full of references to all this British art she might have seen in 1940 London in museums, all the sorts of things you might learn in a lesson book, all the all the, all this great literature. You know, it's kind of built as a web or as a mosaic of all these great books. I mean, I just thought, I wrote this in the author's note, but in a time of war when everything can be destroyed, when our homes can be turned to rubble, the libraries are burned down, You know, what we can carry with us is what we felt and thought and what we can remember and look back on of our own lives, which is a little bit like a book we've learned by heart. So I wanted You can't even (laughs) say a normal sentence without sounding like a poet. (laughs) It's like poet is not your your uh, like vocation. Poet is your identity. Like you are a walking, talking, breathing poem, (laughs) Stephen Sater. Oh, and you I want to tell you when you were like she, this poor girl, she truly believed that uh, reading this book would save this dying boy. And you know where my heart immediately leapt to? It's your mother who was sitting there. My poor mother, yeah. Believing, maybe believing that like reading you Shakespeare would save her oh little my dying God. boy. Wow. And literature did save you. Oh, she was right. That's what you're saying. And for her, it worked. For she saved her dying boy oh, by reading so, to him. Oh, it's so. That's what what a profound and beautiful thing to say, Laura. Oh my God. 
let me tell you something along these exact lines, which shows what a prophetess you are. <laughs> I was I was sitting with my Cassandra. I was sitting with my mother about two weeks ago in L.A. in her apartment in L.A., which is where she's now moved. And she, I was telling her, I'm working on an original musical television series based on a Shakespearean comedy. I didn't know if and, we were allowed to talk about well, this. Well, we can't talk about it fully, but we can t- we can tease it a little okay. bit. I'm, I'm not trying to tease, but it's it's a reality. I'm working on it. And um, she, I. I was talking to her about it and she said, she just stopped and she, I was like saying all this stuff and she said, you have been working on that. You've been, that has been in with you a long time. And I thought she meant those, you know, six years I've been developing as a TV show and the year and a half I was working on as a screenplay before that. She didn't. She said, I read you that when you were a little boy. The Shakespeare play yeah. it's based on? Yeah. It's all connected. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I know. Um, so so your mom's it, still around? My mom is still around. My dad is in a, a dementia facility oh, man. in L.A. So that's what moved her to L.A., uh-huh. which she, where she went kind of resentfully, begrudgingly. From Indiana. She, they, were, they had moved to Florida, and my father w- had gone to a facility there and had been there a while. And my sister felt, my sister's in L.A. My sister has three grown daughters, each of whom has children of her own. Mm. And they thought it would be so great for my dad and my mom to have family around them and for her to be there with my mom and be there with my dad. And um, so that's what, and my brother is in Phoenix, so he's close. And I spend a lot of time in L.A. Mm-hmm. So, but Well, especially now that you're working on a new... Uh, <laughs> new TV project. Yeah. You have a lot of stuff right now in LA. I have the TV project. I have uh, two movies. And it's all musical. Sh- wait, shut up. Okay. So you, s- I'm just going to, I'm not going to make any direct connections. I'm just going to say that two separate unconnected things that Steven Sater said today <laughs> are, he's got two movies. <laughs> And <laughs> there may be future life for Spring Awakening. Now, I'm not making any connection between those two things. I'm just commenting. I'm just reminding us of two separate things that you said today and crossing mm. my fingers so hard. <laughs> well, let me say something, which I was going on. A th- I was asked this by um, Broadway Box, but the interview hasn't run, so I don't know when it's coming out. But there's... A lot of people have reached out to me because there's a movie of Spring Awakening that's announced on IMDb, and it mm. says that Ansel Elgort is in it and Auli Kapaho, and um, that's Ooh, not that's true. that's Moana. I know, but it's not true. Oh. I always ask, is this true, and it's not. It's, it's, it's bullshit. It is, oh, interesting. So, so, so I don't want to deflate people, but it's not true. Got it. Because so, a lot of people have – they asked me on social media, um, and um, – it is just not true. But that said, what I can say is, um, you know, we've been asked through the years about Spring Wake and I've always answered really truthfully. Either there were, t- it's, you know, it's been a long time. There were attempts to get it going. It hasn't gotten going. But we're now at a point where there is, th- I'll just say there's, there's serious activity, like something may be coming together. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I have a question about the book Alice by Heart. Please. And how it relates to the libretto of Alice by okay. Heart. Because, and libretto is the sort of fancy name for the book of a musical, as opposed to the book, the novelization of the musical, right? Yeah. The, the stuff in Alice by Heart, the musical that is not music and lyrics, is the book, the li- yeah. libretto. Yeah, what people say. Right. So... And, do. and sometimes the story. Like, yeah, the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know that you co-wrote the libretto mm-hmm. with Jesse Nelson. Yes. Uh, who also wrote the libretto of Waitress. Yes. Um, and also happens to be the mother of your leading actress. She does. Which is kind of mind-blowing well, to can, me. Well, can I just tell you how that happened? Yeah. Because um, I um, – this was going back – Oh, what year was this? 2009, I think. Uh-huh. I, um, I was living in L.A. at the time. And um, Jesse, who was my writing partner in a couple movies, she had found me. And we were writing these movies together. And I loved her. She's, she's a genius. What movies? It, well, one of them 
was a um, movie we developed. It hasn't come out, okay. but it was a. I don't know if I'm allowed to say what it was, but it was a version of Romeo and Juliet set mm-hmm. in the animal world. Let's put it that way. Whoa. And it's really fun and it's really brilliant. If it hasn't come <laughs> out, then that's the, you could just say that. I wanted to make sure I hadn't missed okay. something major. That's okay. No, no. It, and then we worked on another animated movie together, which was really fun. Um, but um, meanwhile, Jesse's daughter, Molly, was a theater geek. And there was this group, this tribe of kids performing this it was a night called I Believe. And um, they I were performing believe, songs I which believe, were mostly I Spring believe. Awakening songs. So I saw the 15-year-old Ben Platt sing Touch Me. So I saw the oh 15-year-old gosh. Beanie Feldstein and Molly Gordon and Jack Quaid, these incredible kids. Was Catherine who were in Gallagher this tri- in that group too? She was. Yeah. She's amazing. Who you and now collaborate with. Yes, and whom I adore. Um, so we... Um, I was, and my guest for that night was Leah Michelle. So I was sitting with Leah and I was watching these 15 year old kids sing Spring Awakening songs. And I looked at Leah and I thought, wow, this is like you were that age. Because Leah, she was 14 Mm -hmm. and she came in in her brown skirt and blouse and sang, I don't know how to love him, and blew us away. So um, I thought, wow, the Alice. An Alice musical could be about how to leave childhood behind. Mm-hmm. It was the first real insight I had into how it could become. Because Duncan and I were working as a, as a music project, as a songs only project. Because I didn't want to turn. In short, I didn't want to turn Alice Adventures in Wonderland into The Wizard of Oz because it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It's not the structure of the book. In any event, um, I began working on this draft inspired by the kids. And when I finished this draft, the first person I gave it to was my trusted friend Jesse. And we began talking about it. And she, she had really intelligent things that, to say, as she always does, when she felt it was lacking a certain emotional heart. And I began working on it, revising it. And we, then we determined, the three of us, Duncan, Jesse, and I, to do a, two workshops together in L.A. with these kids. And so we did it over their spring break and their summer vacation mm-hmm. at Harvard spring West and Lake. Summer, you might spring and say, summer, you we might did say. it. <laughs> we did it at Harvard West Lake and the second one at the Broad. Those were our first workshops. So Molly Gordon has been the one and only Alice all those years, except when we worked on it at the National Theater. Mm-hmm. We had a British cast. Right. So Molly was always part of it. In a way, Molly preceded Jesse. She didn't. Jesse was part of it, uh, but. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah, like yeah. Jesse just cast her daughter. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. 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 I they were part maybe, of the project all along. I thought maybe you'd been working on it with Molly as the soul librettist, and then you brought on Jesse because she was like around the oh, family or something. Like, oh, I no. didn't know whether it was Jesse was directing it. And then over time, she just, she's a writer director. Mm-hmm. She got so involved. And she, from the beginning, she was so involved in the story and pushing me to incorporate these elements we now almost take for granted in the story, like my illness. Mm. And that, you know, bringing that part of the story into Alfred. And I have no time, I have no time, I have no time because he's dying. Right. Um, so over time, then we said, you know, you're, you're a co-writer of this. Right. You know, so. Yeah, oh, that makes she sense. Was. So, that makes sense. So that also helps. My next question was going to be like, how come she's not, like, why didn't you co-write, co-write the, the novelization we, with her? We, we talked about it. Uh-huh. And she, um, she's super busy. Jesse has a new TV show coming out. She's consumed with that. Are we allowed to talk about that? Is that, I don't know if I am, but she's, but that's, that's actually happening. I may need you to introduce me to Jesse so I can interview her. Yes. But, um, the, uh, also books are such solitary things. It's like Kafka said, you know, a writer can never be alone enough in the theater. You want to be in as a playwright. All you yearn for is to be in rehearsal and to have these people around you and to be, you know, collaborate. As a book writer, as a fiction writer, all I want is for people to leave me alone. It's such a solitary endeavor. You know what that reminds me of is what Marcel Proust said, Uh that the novel is like a cemetery. Uh (laughs) Um, I'm I'm quoting Stephen from the intro to Alice by Heart, because you just know like what every classical writer has ever said about Uh everything. (laughs) You just rattled them off the top of your head as if somebody's like, that reminds me of that Beyonce song you know like (laughs) these are your pop stars well it's like you are what you eat like I've spent my life what happened when I was 20 I had this terrible accident right I was trapped in a fire I was on fire I had to leap off a third story balcony to get out I was laid up on this like ironing board this striker frame for months and months and I banished all film and TV and I taught myself ancient Greek yeah okay hang on (laughs) you just said that all in 15 seconds okay let's just take this point by point I know you've told this story before I think people who have listened to other interviews that you've done probably know it, but I think a lot of people who are tuning into this don't necessarily know that story. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I also don't think 
you can be like, I was in a fire. I jumped out a window. I was put on a essentially like a rotisserie and turned around every two seconds. And I taught myself ancient Greek. Like we need to just okay. So parse that out for me. Yeah. yeah so, I okay. So you so, you had finally recovered from a childhood yeah, living college, in I was so happy. solitary. I was playing the MC in cabaret. I was doing. You know, oh it's like gosh. living my life. Yeah, you would be. I have pictures. Oh my gosh, I must see them. And uh, <laughs> you and I have had several conversations about like oh what should you do with your newish instagram account steven sater how have oh. you not posted the pictures of you at oh the look at you i never thought about that and do you have any pictures of like 15 year old ben platt singing i believe I do. because like that you need to do like a serious throwback thursday series oh really where you take all the pictures of all the things of yourself and all the other people that you've known since way back when. Yeah. yeah. Those you've known. I have oh to. Oh my God. <laughs> Hashtag those you've known. <laughs> it writes itself. <laughs> okay. So you're finally well. This is why you tell me about how, how to deal with social media because your brain thinks better than mine. This is, this is <laughs> like just, to, I'm taking a step back and I'm like, this is what you dream of meeting your heroes being like you're Aww. like not only are we gonna like get along and they're gonna look me in the eye and treat me like a fellow human being but i'm gonna have like we're gonna like instantly turn into collaborators and oh. like i i always you know have you ever met somebody who was like i just felt like if we ever met in person we'd be best <laughs> friends and so sweet and i feel like that actually happened <laughs> okay so you're finally well you go off to college you're playing the mc mm -hmm. and uh your apartment catches on fire? Yeah. Yeah, we lived, um, it was in St. Louis, Washington University, mm -hmm. which you may recall that when they say to Tennessee, when they say to Tom in the Glass Menagerie, <laughs> <laughs> well, shouldn't you take that money, she says, and go to Washington University? He said, I'd rather smoke. And, she, and it was that kind of apartment. It was like this tenement apartment, which was what surrounded Wash U, because we didn't have cars. Mm. And we moved off campus. And the apartment caught fire. This becomes relevant because the, when the apartment caught fire and I was forced, the fire forced me out on this balcony and the flames were coming toward me. There were people below who said, just stay there. The fire department's been called. Mm -hmm. And what happened was because it was such a low rent district, they had closed the fire department and they had to wait for the fire department to come from the wealthier suburb. And so I was standing there. I remember saying, it's getting hot. And the next thing was the, the glass of the French door sort of shattered and it's like flew out at me. I was in a bathrobe and um, the robe caught fire and I had to just throw it off. And someone from below screamed, jump. Uh -huh. And I put the, my face was on fire. I put my hand, I smashed my hand on my face and climbed up on this ledge and just leapt off. And I, I fell, I fell like in push up position. I went down mm -hmm. and I, um, I shattered and fractured a total of like 14 vertebrae. So out of how, like, it doesn't, a norm, doesn't person have like 16. <laughs> like yeah, not many. I, I, the thing is that, um, I'd been doing Alexander work. Do you know what that is? Alexander yeah. technique. Every, I had breathe. just it's, it's I, breathing and posture and it's all about yeah the movement of your spine. I had been playing. I was this ballad of the sad cafe. It's this play by Edward Albee. It's mm -hmm. an adaptation of Carson McCullough's play. I'd been playing this character who's known as a broke back, and I'd been doing this um, Alexander work for months and months every day. And my back, I shattered all these vertebrae, but my back gave all the way up. So the spinal. Um, fluid wasn't broken and had it been which it would normally be just even with like half that many vertebrae broken i would have been paralyzed for life but i wasn't i was paralyzed for some months but um i healed my body healed i stayed in this bed i was my arms and wrists were broken i was burned all over and um it's like you were doing that alexander technique it's like it was prehab it was like pre-rehab yes. for yeah. an accident you didn't know was going to happen. It's just unbelievable how I was protected. Oh, my gosh. It's unbelievable. And um, and it's all like thanks to literature again because if – because like yeah. if Albie hadn't – Had Albie I not been doing that play. Yeah. I know. If Albie hadn't written that adaptation of – who who wrote the original? Carson McCullough. And if Carson, if Carson hadn't – Honestly, Mom's friend. So like if he hadn't written that <laughs> – and if he hadn't been inspired by, like, the way that, believe what you want about spirituality, but the fact is that 
a butter a butterfly flapped its wings a million years ago, and we're all here. You know? Well, let me say this: my the man who directed that play, who was my advisor, his partner was the head of the classics department. He had just written the first how to learn ancient Greek book in like forty years, and they brought it to me in the hospital. And this was and, when you were paralyzed. Yes, and you were and on it, the rotisserie. <laughs> yes, and they brought me this how to read Greek book. And I could put it, because when I was on my stomach, I had, you know, like the same way, like you're getting a massage. There was, I was on my stomach, but there was like a hole. I could see through. Mm -hmm. And I had the book below me. And then as I had movement in my head, and so I had a page turner with my, I turned it with my teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And had a a racer at the bottom of it. And I could turn the pages, which were in clamps. And I started teaching myself ancient Greek. And... I will tell you, you said, referenced it earlier, but were, I, were it not for my immersion in Greek tragedy, there 100% would be no spring awakening because it gave me an idea of a form for the songs and where the lyrics didn't are, forward the story. That's why there were poor tenements in St. Louis. <laughs> Thank goodness for those tenements. Thank goodness that the fire department uh, closed. <laughs> it, it all uh, happened for a reason. I mean, it sounds so, it's so dismissive, of course, of like all the tragedy. And so that's why I say it so like in such a tongue in cheek way, um, because, <laughs> you know, but, but it makes me look at, look at the tragedies around and not like, Oh, good thing. These tragedies are happening today because, mm-hmm. uh, because that means, because it's happening as a, me- uh, you know, a means to an end. But I wonder what art will come out of. I wonder what Phoenix mm-hmm. will spring from the ashes, you know? And of course, thinking about your, just your various times of, quarantine has been really on my mind lately because of all this coronavirus stuff that's wow. happening and like mm-hmm. you know will someone who's has to was who's forced to work from home these this month end up writing the great next great american novel you know what when we're looking for silver linings mm-hmm. retrospective stories like yours are you know, at least can give us hope that something will spring from the ashes of tragedy. There's a Buddhist statement that through illness comes the mind that seeks the way. You know, and was it written about you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's a little older than I am. Oh, okay. um, but um, I don't know that it's necessarily. The, what I would say is, you know, making anything creates so much determination and focus, but it also requires like being willing to deal with your own, with your feelings, with what you've gone through, with the trauma. Yeah, you know, Alice. By heart, it was always we always we were looking at the world and these make all these people living in makeshift shelters around the world, and that's what we thought. You know, these are people. This was 1940, but look how many people in our time are in these camps, with nowhere to go, nothing. You know, under. You know, terrible regimes or in the midst of their countries being bombed. Um, yeah, or just stopped at the resonant. border and of our own country exactly. and stuck into put in cages without their parents. Ugh, oh my gosh. Yeah. <gasps> oh, the world is full of such terrible things. I thank God we have art. Yeah. Well, sorry, I just brought that one down. <laughs> uh, no. Um, well, I think it's I'd be remiss time. to not talk about the thing that m- means the most and is the most of. I don't even want to put a superlative on it. There is an element of Alice by Heart that I never expected that has brought a whole new understanding of the story to me, and that is the use of photographs. Mm. Since we are in an audio for- format right now on the radio, yeah. will you explain about the visuals of the book of the yeah. book and your decision to include them and, and yes. the root of that decision? Yes, I always want to include them because at the beginning of the book, Laris Carroll's amazing book, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which gave rise to all the Alice in Wonderlands we know. Alice famously wonders, what is the use of a book without pictures or conversations? So this book was conceived as a conversation with all the books that had gotten me through. But it also, I wanted to incorporate pictures from the very beginning. And first I wanted to do an illustrated book, and I wanted my son to do the illustrations. But there was no money for illustrations, and my son had other, was busy with other, he was his like, own I projects. I don't care if we're related. I'm not doing that <laughs> I'm for not free, doing Dad. That. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, meanwhile, um, there, were, there were these photographs, which Jesse and I had been uncovering through our internet research, um, these heart-stopping photographs, archival photos of 
of the citizens of London huddled in tube stations during the bombing, because this went on for a year and a half. There were 59 straight nights of Nazi bombing. And the, for, the, first of all, Churchill, they didn't want people in the tube stations. It was so unsanitary. There were, well, like now, people Ugh. could pass viruses, flus, people, where were they going to go to go to the relieve themselves? I don't even want to be you in know. a subway station, like, when it's, yeah, you know, clean. when everything <laughs> yeah. is, is going right. They're cleaner now than they've been. Um, but but um, there was no keeping them out. And um, so the people, they huddled in these tube stations night after night after night. And there's so many pictures of the wreckage of London. So I began incorporating them into the book because the book, Alice in Wonderland is arguably the first, Lewis Carroll's book is arguably the first work of fantasy fiction written for teens. Mm -hmm. And of course there's a fantastical element to this book, but this is also an historical novel. Mm -hmm. And it's more set in the tube station. It's really where the, where the play privileges the time in Wonderland. The book, which fully goes to Wonderland, is also really squarely set in this tube station. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give a sense of the harsh reality and the beauty of that reality of these people huddled in these communities down under the ground. How much of this story, which was written after the musical came out, both yeah. in London and here, how much of this story did you already know before the musical was produced. I learned a lot of this in working on the book. So I did so much research. Maybe you saw at the end, I read so many diaries and journals and Virginia Woolf's diaries and George mm -hmm. Orwell's diary, but also of, of, you know, something really interesting. There was a lot, the, um, the British people felt at the time that the truth was not being represented in the newspapers. Ha ha, talk about something. Fake news. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what it was was because they, the British didn't want to give encouraging signs to the Nazis about how much wreckage had been done by the bombs. So, and, and pressed in a number of private individuals kept journals. And so those journals have now been published. But also writing itself as a discovery, I found in working on the book that I wanted to, you know, there are a lot of these, they're like flashbacks. They're all these chapters or sections of chapters that are in italics where you go back and through the lens of Alice's mind into the past mm -hmm. and her past with Alfred. And I learned so much. And it's actually something a lot of people asked when they saw the show. What was their life like? How did they meet? Yeah. How did they find the book? What were their experiences? Well, so that I, I wrote into the book. I loved the show when I saw it. I found myself listening to the music. It almost was like a visual concept album more than it yeah. was. It, like I That's wanted, I wanted so much more of the story. Yeah, and I wish that I, I, I hope you, I hope this doesn't sound mean. Like I don't mm -hmm. mean it like that. I just, I wish I'd known all of this going into the musical. Uh -huh. I wish that I had known because I felt like I was watching a dream. Uh -huh. You know, and mm -hmm. it was a beautiful. Mm -hmm. moving, dark mm -hmm. dream. And the book now makes me feel like I know the people, not that they're these uh -huh. wisps of, dr of dreams. You know I what see. I mean? I see. And so I don't know if Alice by Heart has, um, you know, like a, a future, whether it does. further uh, that I'm really glad to know that because I think that whether or not the script is changed, mm -hmm. these backstories will inform the audience's understanding of mm -hmm. these these humans and um you know one thing that i've heard from a lot of theater goers is like do we really need any more alice in wonderland and peter pan musicals i know <laughs> like, people say that because they're the last things that were you know that went into the public domain that mm -hmm. are truly popular and this is an aside but i've heard i've heard really like fascinating and scary things that like nothing will ever go into the public domain again because of the power of walt disney and walt Dis <laughs> like the disney gotcha. corporation doesn't want Mickey Mouse to go into the public domain, so they're fighting to like push off public domain laws. That's all totally anecdotal, and I don't know even where I heard it, so I can't quote a source. But in any case, I felt I feel like this the there was there's so much Alice in Wonderland about the stage show of mm -hmm. Alice by Heart, mm -hmm. and the heart of Alice by Heart is in the is in the tube station. Yeah. So I. That's, the, the book. that's why the novel is so important to me and mm -hmm. why and and I actually was like you know how I told you I would read a couple of paragraphs mm -hmm. and then switch to mm -hmm. like just put the book down mm -hmm. that's when I often would turn the album on Oh really? And Oh that's so great to hear that let, they informed so each other. They totally informed each other and I like no longer want one without the other. Ah. Uh, that's so great. Well we are going 
uh, again, I can't fully talk about it. And the plans, <laughs> honestly, are not yet set in stone. But the plan is to go back to work on Alice mm -hmm. and to, in one context or another, be able to um, workshop it prior to going into production again, mm -hmm. to be able to work on the show. Well, and I yes, I will to come happen. to the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, I will be your intern for that as well. <laughs> um, so we're down to our last 10 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and this has been one of the like most fun and satisfying <laughs> interviews of my whole career, of my whole life. Oh. Like, I just feel like there's so much, like you're so generous. Oh. Just with your you. storytelling, with like we, I feel like we've managed to, to give people glimpses into things that they care about and know a lot about and, mm. and give new perspective on them. Mm. Um, I feel like we did a good job of like promoting the work and getting people, <laughs> hopefully getting people excited to purchase the book, which obviously is the reason so. you're here. <laughs> sell some books, um, sell the albums available uh -huh. on Ghost Light Records. Uh -huh. um, but I just, I really feel like the best interviews feel and sound like conversations between friends. Uh -huh. And sometimes actual conversations between friends when put in front of microphones get stilted. The, the friends can't find their same rapport. And you came in here today and I don't know if it's because like you, you were messed up by the time change or what, but like you just, there was no, no pretense, no walls put up. There's not going to be walls between you and me. I know. Even when, even with headphones and microphones. Yeah, no, no. Do we have time to talk about that song, or should we should we just wrap well, up, we, or should we just conclude? I, well, we've awesome. still got a few minutes. I would love to play some music from Let's, Alice by Heart. Do um, that. Just do I want to reference. I want to just fill people in. There is a song from Alice by Heart that uh, that Stephen has shared with me. Um, off the air, several iterations of the song. And so we've been brainstorming ways to share that uh, progress and growth. And I think we'll do that maybe separately. Maybe like it's we a can separate do, thing. We'll yeah. do like a YouTube, we'll tease. We can't really talk about it right now because it's not set in stone. But we're going to collaborate on hopefully a video project that shows the, the um, evolution of a song from Alice by Heart. Okay. So let me Before say we do that, okay. I want to ask you if it's even a fair question to ask, whether uh -huh. you have a favorite song from oh. Alice by Heart or oh. one that is, we'll say, if you can't do favorite, one that feels particularly close to your heart. Right West of now. Words. The opening song. Well, yeah, West of Words was original. I can say this. West of Words was originally a song written for Melchior. <gasps> and it was performed... At. Melchior Gabor. He was. What a it radical. Was. He's such, it was. what is it? He's such a He's radical. He's such a radical. <laughs> we, it was performed at Baruch College mm -hmm. before we went to the Atlantic Theater where we wrote All That's Known. Um, so it was, so it was in his that song. Spot. His, yes, it was. It was aspirational. So I have a recording, which I did not bring, <laughs> um, of Jonathan Groff singing that song. In a very different way and with very different lyrics and very different musical arrangement and all Put the rest it of it. Put it on your Instagram. <laughs> those you've okay. known. Yeah. Throwback those you've known, Thursday. All that, um, that was West of Words. But we can hear another song. I just, that's where, I mean, I love that's Afternoon. That's my favorite song. From, it is? Yeah. Wait, what were you going to say you love? Other songs from Alice by Heart? Yeah. I love Afternoon, of course, mm -hmm. and I have vivid memories and great stories about the writing of that song, which was in my house in LA when Duncan was staying with me and he broke down in tears at the piano. And then the next day we taught it to Ben Platt and Molly Gordon and he broke down in tears all over again in the room with them. And oh. they, and they sang, then they sang it with tears in their eyes. It was extraordinary. Um, and of course, another room in your head, mm -hmm. which was one of the first songs we wrote for the show. Um, well, since we spent so much time talking about both Spring Awakening and Alice by Heart, should we hear West of Words? I think it's yeah. really fitting, and it's such a like again, such an honor to hike. I just feel like I have a little piece of your heart, mm -hmm. and you have a little piece of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, to everyone who ever wanted to meet your heroes, do it. Mm -hmm. It's the best. <laughs> Stephen Sater, mm -hmm. thank you a million times. Well, thank you. It's such a it's so, such a pleasure to be here. Thank it's you. so great. You're right. like a dream. Oh. <laughs> Let's listen to West of Words. Uh oh, hang on. Sorry. I'm having a little YouTube situation. Mm. 
hate it when this happens. That was like the best intro to the song, and then oh. it was nowhere. It's not linking. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Sater. There's a world we knew as we before, before a story entered a time Falling through the ground and falling slow The house is tumbling down, still we know we know All the yearns West of words, west of words A rose remember draws us onward A world adjourned, west of words song of the afternoon the caterpillar poof he's calling you pages turn 